Good afternoon. Our honor is very great today. We have had almost as a miracle, you might say, come across the path of freely speaking, Mr. Ahmed Didat. Mr. Ahmed Didat is very famous in his own world, and if you don't already know him, I hope he will soon be very famous in yours. He is a Muslim. His title of the lectures that he is going to do, and the not really debates, but the discussions with people here in Geneva, are Christianity and Islam, Christ in Islam, and the Prophet of Islam and the Bible. Now, we are doing this interview. It is both filmed and it is on audio tape. We are doing this on the 16th of March, 1987, for any information or dating that you might want to know before it or after it. And the, the events that will bring Mr. Dot closer to you than this interview are going to be on Tuesday, the 17th of March, 1987, at the University in Geneva, on Wednesday, the 18th of March, in Uni 1 at the Aula B106, and the Prophet of Islam and the Bible, Thursday, the 19th of March, at 8 p.m., Uni 1, Hall B106. So that having that out of the way, because I know the, the uh, interest that you will show to this, let me then welcome, with a very warm spiritual greeting, our friend Ahmed Didat. Thank you very much, ma'am. Now, of course, when I tell the people where you're from, yes, it's going to be a big shock, and they think we're going to talk politics. Yes, Mr. D. Dot is from South Africa. Now, we are not going to dwell on that subject in politics really today, but I do think for our beginning, we'd like to know what brought you to South Africa, yes, and how was your religious background developed in that country? Yes, ma'am. See, I was born in India. And in 1927, my father, who had proceeded to South Africa, he called me so that I can obtain better education and better means of livelihood. And since 1927, up to date, most of my life I spent in South Africa. And you're, uh, how many Muslims are there in South Africa? We are about half a million Muslims there. Mm -hmm. About half of these half a million, they originate in the Far East and the Far East meaning Indonesia and Malaysia, and the other half originate in the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent. This is about the half a million Muslims. It's a quarter million from the Far East and quarter million from the, uh, what you would say, India, Pakistan. Now, uh, Mr. Didat, I understand that when you talk about people like Bishop Mokwena, who represents four and a half million black uh, Christians, you talk about Bishop Barnabas, uh, mm -hmm. No, 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 not Bishop Tutu. Uh, the bishop who has the three million people oh, that comes yes. at Easter, Barnabas, Zion, the Zion, Barnab Christian, the Zion Church. Christian Church. Yes. And then you have all of the churches represented by the World Council of right, Churches. Right. Then you have the white Afrikaner churches, right. those on the far right. Yes. Then you have Afrikaner churches to the center and to the left. Yes. You have every other kind of religion. I yes, know some metaphysicists. Yes, yes ma'am. Where do your Muslims fit into all of that potpourri Yes. of religious feeling. Yes. You see, now the Muslim, he stands out in this, that his religion makes him opposed to apartheid, mm -hmm. where artificially you're creating standards, false standards of judging people. Mm -hmm. Because the only standard the Muslim believes that God accepts is your behavior. The Quran tells us, Ya Yohannas, mean all mankind, Inna khalaknakum min dhakarim wa unsa. So most certainly, he has made you all of a single pair, a male and a female. And it is he who has made you into nations and tribes. Purpose behind it? It says, that ye may recognize one another. This Mr. John is a Frenchman. This Mr. Jan John is a Swiss. This Mr. John is, uh, so for the purpose of recognition, these are convenient labels. And the only valid standard of judging one another is, the Quran says, Inna akaramakum in the Allahi atkakum. So most certainly, the noblest in the sight of God is He who is the best in conduct. Not black or white, not rich or poor, but the best in conduct. This is the standard. And the standards by which we are being judged in South Africa is totally opposed to our standards.
Now, uh, last question on that subject. Is there any one of those religious groups anywhere on either side of any color line that has members of it that are all perfect, that are not showing any form of discrimination, perfect is a silly word, that are not showing any form of discrimination or not being political in a bad way about their things? Has anyone found the real truth of the truth? Well, I can't seem to see a single church or denomination that, you know, uh, practices altruistically, you know, these true standards. They have, what you would say, uh, conveniently at times, they broadcast that this cathedral is now open to all races at all services. But for 300 years they didn't do that. It's out of certain, I feel, uh, reasons best known to themselves, for, for political ends, mm -hmm. that uh, the African, the black man is becoming conscious, becoming more and more aware about these discriminations uh, by the churches themselves. The churches themselves, you know, those who claim to be very broad-minded, they have been discriminating themselves. For example, for 300 years, we never had a black bishop in the country. Not Anglican, not Roman Catholic. But now, all of a sudden, you have Bishop Tutu, you know, he's an Anglican bishop. You have uh, Bishop Zulu, he's a Zulu bishop. How did it come about? For 300 years, you couldn't produce one. So, no, I think there are other reasons then, uh, altruistically, religious standards by which they are working. And so can anybody can go to a mosque on any... Mosque, anybody, black, white, there is no discrimination whatsoever. Even today with all the people talking about... Uh, but you, you have know, to be Muslim. Uh, you no, have to no, be Muslim. non -Muslim. You in don't the, have to be in Muslim. The mosque, the mosque that uh, I'm one of the guides in, uh -huh. in, in the mosque in Durban, and we get about more than 12,000 tourists a, 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 a month, you know, of, really? I didn't of know the that. Jews and the Christians, you know, people coming from all over the world, they come along, and one of the most important places that people do visit in Durban is the mosque, the largest mosque south of the, uh, south of the equator, happens to be in Durban. And these people come along and they are most welcome, you know, whether they are Christians or they are Jews or the atheists or agnostics, everybody is welcome. And we welcome them and we explain to them what goes on and we give them free literature on Islam and they go away happy, 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 you know. It makes us happy to welcome everybody now. Now, Mr. Ahmed Didat, we have explored your background in South Africa, where you've come from, and uh, we are now very interested in the fact that I have heard that you are one of the most, um, how do you, not advanced, deepest, uh, best, what is the adjective that you know as much about the Christian religion and Bible and as much about Judaism as you do about Islam, and that your, your message is not to be divisive, yes. but to point out what's good. Let me yes. just ask you, yes, speak to us, where do you find this healing force? You see, our belief is that the, the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims, you know, in their origin these three religions are Semitic religions and they have a common background in Father Abraham. The Jew respects Father Abraham, the Christian respects him and the Muslim respects him. And we all claim a common heritage coming from Father Abraham. And I believe that it is the same religion. You see, whether you call it Judaism, Christianity or Islam, to me these are not three separate religions. It is the same religion on different levels. The titles were given by man with regard to the term Judaism. Because I've been asking Jews, Jewish learned men, that this word Judaism, is it to be found in the Torah? They says no. As, is it in your Talmud? He says no. Is it in your Mithna? He says no. And so where did you get it? Most of them are puzzled. Where did the word Judaism originate? As is Christianity, is this in the Bible? Any Bible? Does it speak that the religion preached by Jesus Christ was Christianity? No. So where did this term come from? The very first time the word Christian was used, we read in the New Testament, was at Antioch when the enemies of the followers of Jesus disparagingly they pointed to them saying that these are Christians meaning the worshippers of Christ but Christ never heard the word Christian and Christ never heard the word Christianity and I go beyond and I say Christ never heard the word Christ in his lifetime but <laughs> didn't he say uh, I and the Father 
are one, are one yes. and therefore doesn't that mean in Judaism, me talking about this, but doesn't that mean that if I and the Father are one, that that spirit is imminent in me and that therefore he would be the Christ? Or he, that he would acknowledge himself as being the Christ uh, that were foreseen by the Jews? How am I doing, Mother? <laughs> yeah. No, Christ, you see, the term Christ, it comes from the word Messiah, the Hebrew yeah. word Messiah. The Hebrew word Messiah, Arabic, Masi, is the same word, same root form, <coughs> going back to the word Masaha in Hebrew and Arabic, which means one who is anointed, uh, rubbed over, massaged. Mm -hmm. uh, priests and kings were anointed in consecration to the officers, mm -hmm. like a, a coronation ceremony or like a gowning ceremony. So when a person was officially appointed to a certain status, he was the Messiah, the anointed one. Hebrew word Messiah. Translated, translated into uh, Greek, Christos, from which they locked up the os and left you with Christ. Then what is Christ yes. in Islam? Yes. Uh, in Islam we accept that Jesus was the Christ meaning he was the one that was promised by God Almighty to come to the Jews and reform the Jews. Now, when he came, he claimed that he was the Messiah, from which we get the word Christ, through the word Christos, and from which again we get the word Christianity. But Christ, the word Christ was never heard by Jesus in his lifetime, because this is the Greek word. He said, I am the Messiah. Mm -hmm. He didn't say, I am the Christ, in Greek because he's talking to the Jews, a Jewish prophet, coming to Jews, speaking that Jewish language, Hebrew or Aramaic. He did, yeah, Aramaic. I Aramaic, he yes. So while he's speaking, he's saying in his own language, is that I am the Messiah, uh -huh. the anointed one, the, anointed the chosen one. one. But his people didn't recognize him. They insinuated that he was an imposter, and as such, they had him hanged on the cross. Mm -hmm. The Muslim attitude is that he was the true messenger of God, and he was the Messiah. And more than that, that he was born miraculously, without any male intervention, and that he gave life to the dead by God's permission, and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. So we are going further than the Jews in the acceptance of Jesus Christ. Do you have any Jewish friends? Yes, do I do have, and I also reason with them. Are you sure you have Jewish friends? <laughs> yes, I do have that. I worked for Jews um, for a number of years, and we had fantastic relationship, man. And I have addressed Jewish audiences. And they seem to respond beautifully, you know, to my messages. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So, Christ in Islam, you recognize him. Uh, the Jews do not. They are still waiting that Messiah. And then where does your prophet, sir, the prophet of Islam and the Bible, come in? Yes. You see, Muhammad came 600 years after Jesus. Jesus the Christ. 600 years after. Uh -huh. God Almighty appointed him. And now there was a dispute going on in his own environment between the Jews and the Christians with regards to the personality of Jesus. What was his stand? What would be the stand of his followers? So he clarifies the position for us with regards to Jesus, that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. He was the Messiah. He was born miraculously, but he was not God in human form. He's not God oh, incarnate. And he's not the begotten son of God. How can you tell that from the Bible? The Bible also tells us the very same thing. I mean, in my reading of the Christian uh -huh. Bible, nowhere, nowhere does Jesus ever say at any time, I am God or worship me. Nowhere. There is not a single Bible among the many versions. There is not a single statement, an equivocal statement, anywhere in any Bible. But on the contrary, like you had mentioned a few minutes back, about um, I and my father are one. Uh -huh. Now, people, when they read that, the Christian, now he is, I say, programmed. We are all programmed. There is no doubt about that. But we must be big enough to say, let's see if you can reprogram me. Now, the Christian has been programmed to think that when he said, I and my father are one, which meant that he was claiming divinity, that he is God himself. We says, no, he didn't mean in that sense. Those Jews, you know, according to the Christian scriptures, they took exception to that statement of his. Mm -hmm. But he explains, he said, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are gods, that people are even called gods in the scriptures. 
and you take no, you find no fault with that. Why are you taking exception to me when I say I am the Son of God? So in other words, now he was speaking in the sense that God Almighty and him, in purpose they are the same, not in omnipotence, in omniscience, uh, or in any other or spiritual matters. He, as he says, he said, I, not, I says, my, I says, my father is greater than I. So my father is greater than all. He said, I can of my own self do nothing. God can do everything. He knows everything. He says, of that day, in the last day, no, no man, no, not the angels, not the son, but the father in heaven. No way does he claim equality with God. He's always a, a subordinate position. But now people, these statements are taken to me out of context and a religion has been made out of it. Uh, what about Muhammad? Muhammad is, is no more than a messenger. Is he a messiah? Messenger. No, he no. is the messenger of God. He's a messenger. Yes, Jesus was also a messenger, uh -huh. but he was somebody that the Jews were waiting for, to liberate them from the Roman bondage, to free them. He had come to do a spiritual job of work. As he's, he's, he told Pilate, Pontius Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, mine is a spiritual kingdom. Mm -hmm. I want to elevate these people spiritually. The people of the time, naturally being under bondage, under Roman rule, they wanted somebody, a physical liberator, making them masters of the world. So the man was not prepared to do that. So the Jews as a people, they had rejected him. But we feel that he was the Messiah that was promised to the Jews. But if, uh, if Muslims have Muhammad and the Christians have Jesus, and the Jews don't have anybody yet, is that right? No, they have Moses and the prophets. Well, but I they mean, they Moses don't have a latter day. They, yes. Theirs go way, way back. You see, they, because we feel that they missed the bus with regards to Jesus. But Jesus was the Messiah. But now the Jews have given up all hope of the Messiah. They don't talk about the Messiah anymore. See? I bet they look. don't in their hearts. I bet they don't. Yes, because they said, now look, we now need, they will take matters into our own hands. They wanted the Messiah to come and do a job for them. And... Uh, the practical philosophy they applied, you know, Theodore Hertz, they said, now we will get what the Messiah is supposed to do. And they did it. 1948, they established the state of Israel. We well, took the hands out of the Messiah's hand and they, did, they established the state of Israel. For the first and only time that I was in Israel, I was in a dining room by myself and I didn't know anything about the holy days, I didn't know anything about the customs, and I was finishing my supper and I heard uh, kind of a, a little a singing and when I looked over and I saw some men softly singing I honestly thought they were drunk and I was sort of embarrassed and then as this sound went around the room this beautiful beautiful sound came in these deep voices then I realized that they all had little books and that they were singing and giving thanks at the end of a meal and the tears came to my eyes it was so beautiful and I felt the spirit so strongly I can't describe to you how strongly I felt that. And I, I truly felt that I was linked. I didn't know what they were singing. I didn't know anything about it. But I knew that the presence of the Spirit was there. And that's what I call the Spirit that I felt when I first saw you. That same Spirit because you have a radiant face, you know. No, you do. And you, have, you don't have all those worry lines and those lines of that, that anguish that people that don't know God Yes, and so I feel that in you, I felt it in them, and I hope it is observed in a tiny bit in myself, and that's to me what's that unity. Is that called, is that the Christ? Is that spirit? Is that, did, did Mohammed have a word for it? What is that? I think it is to be in tune with God. See, if we are trying to do, fulfill the, the plan of God, His word, automatically I feel that this spirit permeates in the person. Though you might carry what I would say, wrong labels. You know, we can have wrong labels put onto ourselves mm -hmm. because we think maybe uh, I, if I put this label is the right one or that one, but I think it's not the label. It is the spirit, haq, truth. The Quran says, al min rabbikum wa la takun min al It says, truth comes from God alone. So be not be of those who doubt. There is only one truth and that truth is from God. Whatever God says is truth. Once you are in tune with that, you vibrate on his wavelength. You don't become gods, but you are on his same vibration as, he, as his vibration. Now, Mr. Dida, how can you explain, sir, in your, with your deep knowledge of 
of uh, all of the religious literature, how can you explain that people from your religion, people from Christianity, people from Israel, people from every other religion, and especially those with no religion at all who deny God, that we're all out there cheerfully slaughtering each other every single day from morning until night, and sometimes they stay up all night to get the job done. True, true, man. Where you is see, God and, and you know, Mohammed, it is, everybody? It is know? programming. Man. You see, we all can get programmed into any types of attitudes. I mean, we take Germany, Hitler at Germany. Is Germany one of the most cultured nations in Europe? Is it possible that they could have incinerated six million Jews under Hitler? Obvious answer is no. How can a nation so cultured do a thing like that? But programming, we all can get brainwashed. And I say, whether Muslim, Hindu, or whatever, you know, titles you give to yourself, we all can be programmed into right and wrong. But to look at the problem objectively is very difficult. To get rid of our prejudice, as Roger Bacon, you know, he said, it is easier for a man to burn down his own house than to get rid of his prejudices. It's very true. Whether Muslim, Christian, Jew, it applies to all. But now, if we can become big enough to say, now, let us see what have you got. What is truth and where is truth? Let us have some objective standards of judging truth. Not what I want to believe or what you want to believe. Let us see. And if there is a document, and we believe that there is a document, which we say, the Holy Quran, when you open this book, and if you went, didn't know that you were reading the Quran, if you came across pieces of these writings, say in English, mm -hmm. like the birth of Jesus, for example, mm -hmm. from the Quran. And I have shown this to Christians, you know, Orthodox Christians, born again Christians. I so said, just have a look at this, the birth of Jesus in the Quran. It says, Why is Qalatil Malaika to Ya Maryamu? It says, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, Inna Allah hastafaki wa taharaki wa stafaki ala nisail alameen that God Almighty has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Now, so when you read words like this in English without seeing the Arabic text, in a, that, that portion, I said, if I read further to you, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if I read it all to you, if you read this on a piece of paper lying around, in a hundred years, in a thousand years, you'll never guess you're reading the Quran. No, the I Christian. wouldn't. Have. The Christian. I said, you would think that maybe this is the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, if you haven't seen one. Maybe this is the Greek Orthodox version of the Bible, which you might not have seen one. Maybe this is the New World Translation of the Bible by the Jehovah's Witnesses, if you haven't seen one, and on and on. But you'll never guess you're reading the Quran. Why? Because it's so close to your heart. See, what, what is being said is so close that Jesus is the Messiah. He was born miraculously. He gave life to the dead by God's permission. He healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. Now, it's so close to your heart that it is like your own book. But, and that is with regards to any message. Any way you read, you say, as if there is somebody talking to you, I said, that somebody is God. Objectively, you can read. And as if this message is being spoken to your heart direct. See? But now, what happens before you touch the book? A prejudice has already been created in your heart and mind. This is uh, something that might burn your spirit or you know, destroy you. No, I think the Western <laughs> mind says that's Khomeini and that's uh, um, that is, too. That, it, they that just is today. But uh, even yeah. before Khomeini, you see, I have sometimes Orthodox Christians coming along. There was uh, one young man who was a Roman Catholic. He came for some other purposes. Then chatting, chatting, I took a liking to the man. I said, look, I'd like to present you with this Quran. <laughs> And as if I was offering him some uh, fire, you know, to, mm -hmm. to hold on to fire. I said, no, he can't have that. I said, look, read it, man, and see. And uh, it took me a long time to persuade him to take the book. I said, read it, see what it has to say. And after reading it, he was a changed man. He said, he didn't expect, you know, what he's seeing it in here. Another elderly gentleman, we presented him with the Quran, this holy book. And after some time, I phoned him up. I said, now, how's your progress? He said, no, I haven't read it yet. Again, another time. He said, I haven't had time to go to it yet. Three or four times I phoned the man. Then he says, look, man, I have been reading it all along. But, you know, I can't help agreeing with the book. And I'm too old to change now. <laughs> so, therefore, this is the problem. I'm too old to change. But he's reading it all along, and he can't help agreeing with every principle that is enunciated. 
it is coming from the source of all truth. We say from God. And if you, without prejudiced minds, if you open the book, you see what it does to you. It must change, create a change. Did God choose Muhammad or did Muhammad choose God to come? I mean, did he go to him or which one came? You see, we believe that God chose Muhammad. Uh -huh. He chooses his messengers, God Almighty. He chooses his messengers. And these choosing are not of our standards. Like he chose Moses. He's a man who was a renegade from the law. He had killed an Egyptian. Secondly, he was a stutterer. He used to stutter. God chose him. We believe that God chose him to be his mouthpiece. He chose Jesus. A person without the genealogy. We believe he was born miraculously. The Christians say he was born miraculously. So where is his father? A man without a father that he can point to. Now you, God goes and chooses a man like that. And as he says, of poor background. He says the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nest. But the son of man hasn't got a place to rest his head. He goes and chooses such a man. Why? That's his business. Then he chooses Muhammad. A man who was absolutely illiterate. A person who didn't know how to read or write. A man who couldn't sign his own name. And he goes and chooses a man like that. Naturally, the more learned, the affluent, feel jealous. But now that one man, illiterate man, he brought about a book. This book, which in its material magnitude, it outshines any author of the Holy Bible. For example, the Holy Bible consists of some 66 books mm -hmm. of the Protestant Bible, mm -hmm. the 73 books of the Roman Catholics. Mm -hmm. These 66 books are authored by 40 different persons. Mm -hmm. And the most voluminous writer of all these 44, us, 40 writers, is Paul. He wrote 14 of the 27 books. More than 50% of the books of the New Testament were written by Paul. Mm -hmm. But when you take that, it's a little thing like this, mm -hmm. those 14 books. Mm -hmm. Sometimes half a page, one page is a book. Mm -hmm. This is, if this is Muhammad's job, it's a one-man job. One man job, an illiterate man, he outshines every author that you can think of, of the scriptures. So I said, now where did he get it? He says, it's given to me by inspiration. He takes no credit for it. And when you look at it, you find he's not talking about himself at all. Did he dictate it? He dictated it. Dictate As he was moved, inspired, mm -hmm. he dictated it and it was preserved. Mm -hmm. In his lifetime, he was dictating to people that they should write it down and have it read, read, read to him again. And he is to confirm, right? And this is now part of the scripture, part of the scripture. During the 23 years of his prophetic life, whatever was given is now contained in this volume called the Holy Quran. Then why do you think that a man, you can understand why God would choose an illiterate because it is our own intellect so often and our own uh, enrapture with our own wisdom and everything we've learned and our own uh, personality. Right that keeps us from listening to that inner voice. Right. And it's easy to think that God would say, you know, yeah. uh, enough of that, right. and choose yes. a, a person who is illiterate, who is not illiterate, because if you are with the Spirit... Right. All right. Now then, the thing I still don't understand is that starting from all those prophets, that we who follow, and each one who professes to follow this prophet or that prophet or none but we kill and we maim and we lie and if i must say even when you peek into the whole issue of human rights on earth of any issue you can imagine the hypocrisy the lying cheating stealing all of these things that i see that as a mother uh, sometimes I, I face despair. How can we do that with all those prophets having come? Yes. And you've got uh, 12 minutes to answer yes. that yes. and yes. save yes. the world. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you see, this is uh, the nature of man. He made us, he gave us limited free will. God made us, he gave us limited free will. And he gave us guidance. He showed us the straight from the crooked path, how we are to distinguish between the two. But human prejudice keeps on coming in. Animality keeps on coming in, like Cain killing Abel, brother killing brother. Uh, in the Holy Quran, an allegory is given about the creation of man. It says, it says God says to the angels, it says, fil ardi khalifa. So most certainly I'm going to create my vicegerent on earth. 
my viceroy, my representative. So the angels, seeing that this machine that God was making, with free will and emotions, will come into conflict and create mischief and shed blood. So they say, it's allegorically, they tell God, he says, Qalu atajalu fiha man yufsidu fiha wa yasfiqud dima. He said, are you going to create one who's going to make mischief and shed blood? What does God say to that? He doesn't say, no, this man will be perfect in my image and he will be godly and he'll pray five times a day or twenty times a day and will be charitable and self-sacrificing. Nothing of the kind. He says, Qala inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. He said, what I know about this fellow, you don't know. In other words, what you say is true, that he is a maker of mischief and sharer of blood. But there is something else in him, which the angels as uh, automatons, you know, they carry out God's will and plan, his bidding, but they don't understand the intricacies of the mind of man, that this human being is capable of self-sacrifice. But can they understand this, this, this machine, what it can do? Like that uh, happening a little while back in Britain, you know, there was a heavy storm at sea, and a dog got washed away into the sea. And one policeman who was on duty nearby, he dived in to rescue the dog. And he was in trouble, so another policeman went along to help him out. And in turn, one after another, seven policemen drowned to save one dog. Now, can the angels understand that? No. So he said, in other words, that God Almighty, you see, He's given us this opportunity to be godlike. And He's given you that freedom. Without that freedom, we would be all robots. If we prefer to be robots, Oh, you, would have, you could have if you wanted to make us also robots. He said he's got enough angels, angels to do his bidding. But he wanted man voluntarily to carry out his bidding. And there are people, mankind, they make sacrifice. What did um, Mohammed say about forgiveness and salvation? And we're going to ask that right after this break. You see, the idea that the Christian has is that man was born in sin. He says, uh, the sin, the original sin, committed by Adam and Eve, inherited by we, his children, and uh, somebody has to pay for that, to rectify the situation. That the Muslim belief is that they did make a mistake, but they paid fully for whatever they had done. And as such, every human child that is born into the world is born pure, is born sinless. Whether the child is born in the home of a Jew, a Christian, a Hindu, an atheist, or an agnostic, that child, if dies before the age of discretion, that child, according to us, goes to heaven. No questions asked. It is after reaching the age of discretion that that person is made responsible for his or her action. So sin is not inherited. Sin is an acquisition. Forgiveness, when we make mistakes, is that again, you pay for your own sins. And forgiveness is, is that you ask God sincerely, you repent for what you have done, and God forgives. Because He is, we believe, is a merciful God. He is not like Shylock, wanting his pound of flesh. What is his motive? His motive is, is that if you do right, if you make an effort, it is acceptable in his sight. He does not need the blood of an animal or that of a human being to wash away your sins. And this is exactly as the Bible teaches, as we learn from the book of Ezekiel, it says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Whoever sins, perishes, pays the price. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Meaning, if father Adam, if he sinned, you do not have to carry his, you don't have to pay for his crimes, his sins. Neither shall the son pay for the iniquity of the father, or the father pay the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. Whatever good thing the good man does, he gets his fruits, his benefits, his reward. And, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So whatever the evil monger does, he gets punished for that. And the way of salvation is, it tells us very, very briefly, very, very succinctly, it says, but if the wicked will turn, repent, come back, from all the sins that he has committed, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die, he will not perish. That is salvation in Islam. You do the will and plan of God to the best of your ability and whatever your shortcomings, you apologize before the Lord and He is forgiving. He can forgive you a million times over if you approach Him sincerely. He does not need the blood of a man or of a man-God or of animals to, 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 to pay for your sins. You know, Mr. Didat, you um, have 
uh, some interesting recent history that I would like to cover, if I may, because I think it's, it's really very germane to everything we're talking about. You just came from uh, the United States, and you made a tour there, and some very interesting things happened to you. Why don't you tell us about <laughs> yes, that? Who, with whom you discussed and what happened? Yes. You see, there is a um, uh, man, I think he's a giant today, among in the Christian world, the missionaries, the preachers, uh, Jimmy Swagger. Yes, Jimmy Swaggart is a well-known uh, Bible-believing uh, Christian with a TV ministry as well as another one who is very famous in America. He is boasting that he appears on 2,000 TV stations of the world in 140 different countries. Mm -hmm. His daily budget is a million dollars a day. That's almost as big as mine for freely speaking. <laughs> million dollars a day. And somehow, uh, you know, he is in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and there's a university. The town has grown around the university, uh -huh. Louisiana University, and they are some Muslim students uh -huh. with whom they have been having a little kind of arguments and debates with uh, Swaggart and his ministry. So he had a debate with some Muslim ones, and he had a debate with another Muslim ones. And for the third time, they called me over from South Africa to debate with Jimmy Swaggart. And uh, I think from the Muslim point of view, it went off fantastically well. Uh -huh. you know, the debate, as well as the question and answers that followed. You know, we have made two separate videotapes of that. Mm -hmm. The debate, this is what you call V33, mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Swaggart and I, and question and answers lasting for about two hours. Mm -hmm. um, and I think... Was there a winner and a loser, or uh, did you remain <laughs> friends? Was it friendly, or yes. how did it come out? Uh, as far as the winning and losing is concerned, we would leave it to the audience. You know, leave it to uh, God, probably. Leave it to God, yes. in the ultimate. <laughs> but the audience also will be able to see for themselves, you know, where truth is weighed heavily, you see, on which side. But uh, the relationship was exceptionally good. From the word go, when we finished off, we embraced one another, and he invited me home for lunch. You know, that was something fantastic. But what about the rest of the people of the Christian faith? You know, there again you see on the screen that as soon as the debate was fi finished, the people were shocked. They couldn't even speak to one another. You watch them, you know, usually as soon as the thing is over, you know, you start yeah, chatting, da, 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 cross da, 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 chat, da, 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 nothing yes. at all, as if they all had seen a ghost. <laughs> so it, it proves something. You see, it was something beyond their expectation, that a Muslim can come forward and uh, speak about the Bible, quote the Bible, more than the preacher can. But everything he spoke, I proved it from the book, the book, the book, the book. This is what the Bible says, this is what the Bible says. You know, in other words, I was able to use the Holy Bible against a Bible thumper. You know, one a Bible preacher. He's an expert on the subject, but he found that uh, he was... Well, of course, Christians do that to each other, I'm sorry to say, but I mean, we got about, you know, 50 different interpretations of that Bible okay. just in one pew Quite on true. Sunday, and when they all get at it yes. about what the end of the word said on the end of the parchment, right. and when everybody lines right. up, right. and then they separate churches because yes. of one this or one that, yes. I mean, I'm not saying that's wrong because I believe everyone has the right to do yeah. what he wants. Yeah. I'm saying that it's not exclusive to Christianity because there are so many sects it, with the Muslims yes. and in Judaism yes. you've got the, the highs and the lows and the yes. mediums yes. and the yes. in-betweens yes. and the out to the rights and the out to the lefts yes. and the politics yes. and the no yes. 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 Okay, look, yes. we've got three minutes. I've got to yes. hold you yes. to this. Excuse yes. me. Yes. Now, in three minutes we've got to cover the whole rest of the world yes. and find yes. universal peace. You yes. ready? Yes. Okay, first thing is, didn't somebody refuse to debate with you at all and they wouldn't even see you and wouldn't let you uh, have any You see, we coverage. have been trying very, very hard. Billy Graham. Yeah. He won't touch me. He won't come anywhere near me. See, Billy Graham. Then we tried Jim, uh, Jimmy, uh, not uh, Jerry Falwell. Mm -hmm. Then we tried Pat Robertson. And each and every one of them, they seem to be fighting shy. Pat Robinson doesn't have a Muslim constituency for running for president. I think maybe that. <laughs> you see? But now, what it is now, you see, we say Islam has the answers to all your problems. Uh-huh. Uh, I was telling them in America, I said, look, Jimmy Swaggart has written some 30 different books, a book on incest, on homosexuality, on uh, surplus women, I'm sorry, he didn't write on surplus women, on pornography, and so on and so on. But I said, now look, the answers, alcoholism, said the answers to all your problems are contained in the book, the Quran, which gives you clear-cut answers to all your problems. And this man, Muhammad, we say, is the spirit of truth which Jesus promised you 
before he parted, he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak from himself. Now he said, that spirit of truth is Muhammad. And he has given you guidance. It is for the world to take for its own benefit. Now, I cut my own throat here because I was going to ask him the hard question about the parables of the vineyard and how he was going to explain that because the Muslims, you know, they don't drink alcohol and yet uh, that's in the Bible and everything. And I couldn't. So you have to go ask him yourself at one of these three meetings, which are uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 17, 18, 19th of March at Uni 2. And uh, I would also like to say... I'm still a Christian after this program, uh, I, but I still feel spirit. And not only do I feel it here, but I feel it with you, because what you have given and what you send back to me and all of these lovely things, I know we are united. I just know it, that's all. And I love you all. And so, Mr. D. Dot, you know, and freely speaking, we have... Uh, we have a tradition, which is the guest gets the last word, usually if I can stop talking fast enough. Yes, and now it's your turn, and you have that time for your last message to the Thank people. You. I say to the people who are listening, Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be unto you all. This is a universal greeting of Muslims all over the world. Assalamu Alaikum, peace be unto you all. Thank you very much for coming. Pleasure. And good night. <laughs>